these are the hardest of the hardcore. These are the highest high-risk people. And uh, others that we have released have gone back into the fight. That's been documented. So, uh, and it's disturbing to me that the Taliban are the ones that named the people to be uh, released. Senator John McCain yesterday speaking about this uh, huge story that we've been talking about all morning, the exchange of five Gitmo prisoners, top, as you just heard John McCain say, the hardest of the hardcore members of the Taliban who have been sitting in Gitmo since the war began in Afghanistan in exchange for this POW. Joining us right now, Thomas Jocelyn. He's a senior fellow at Foundation for Defense of Democracies. And, uh, sir, you wrote specifically about these hardest of the hardcore in the Weekly Standard. Who are these guys, and are we now, uh, are the are American people more in danger because they are now free? Well, Senator McCain is right that these are the worst of the worst. You know, the, the population in Guantanamo, since it was opened in early 2002, was sort of a mixed bag, but these guys are undoubtedly part of the worst part of that population. Um, you're talking about guys, uh, a couple of them who are accused of mass murder. You're talking about all five of them were deemed high risk by Joint Task Force Guantanamo to the U.S., its interest in its allies. And uh, two of them are actually wanted by the U.N. for war crimes, and all five of them are actually uh, guys who were deeply in bed with al-Qaeda prior to 9-11. These are guys who were really cementing the relationship between the Taliban and al-Qaeda prior to 9-11. The problem is the risk to the U.S. Um, is that if these guys are able to impact the battlefield in Afghanistan uh, before all American forces are withdrawn, one of their subordinates was actually actually released from Guantanamo and went on to become the chief uh, military commander for the entire Taliban. As the guy who personally oversaw the deaths of 12 U.S. Marines and actually impacted the lives of thousands upon thousands of Afghans. So these guys are very, very dangerous. One of their subordinates got back into the game from Guantanamo and had a huge impact on the battlefield. These guys have the capacity to do that. And they have the capacity to do that even from Qatar, where they're going to be held for supposedly for a year or live for a year, because Qatar is a major uh, financial hub for the Taliban and al-Qaeda, and they can easily take part in fundraising efforts there on behalf of them. So let me get this right. We've just released five high-value detainees, some of the worst of the of the bad Taliban guys that we had in our custody, in order to get this guy back. Okay, they have to stay in Qatar for a year, but they're then going to be free to go back to Afghanistan about the time that the United States will be out. Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, well, there, there are other, yeah, that's exactly right, but there are other factors here, too, I, I would say, is that even in the year they're in Qatar, they can they can yeah. be damaged, because there, there are ways for them to get, get back in the game. In fact, Senate Democrats, including Carl Levin in early 2012, objected to this exact same deal because he was worried that they would have the ability to impact Taliban's propaganda efforts, fundraising efforts, and the like from Qatar. So um, I would say that this is, a, this is a terrible deal. It's a deal done on the Taliban's terms, not America's terms. And listen, I've been studying the Guantanamo population for over a decade, and these are the five worst Taliban commanders to be held in U.S. custody there. And, there's, there. There's nobody, I would say, that was worse than these five. And, and, and let me just, I just want to, you know, echo what you uh, just said earlier, and that is that these guys were deeply involved with al-Qaeda when Afghanistan was used as the base, the training ground to launch the 9-11 attack. Now, now, just last weekend, when the president flew to Afghanistan to speak with our troops there for Memorial Day, he told them this. We're going to make sure that Afghanistan can never again, ever, be used again to launch an attack against our country. Seven days later, he released these five senior Taliban people, the people who helped make Afghanistan the place to launch an attack against our country in the first place. Thomas Jocelyn, was that statement by the president correct? Well, I mean, I think he, he thinks he's going to prevent Afghanistan from being uh, a base for launching attacks against us. But, you know, they've sort of subtly changed their rhetoric over time. It used to be that, that al-Qaeda was no longer going to have a safe haven in Afghanistan. Um, that's not true. Al-Qaeda has safe havens in Afghanistan today, right now, in Kunar, Nuristan, and other select provinces of Afghanistan. So now they're, they're saying that basically, well, we're not going to allow them to attack us from Afghanistan, which is sort of, you know, shifting the goalposts a little bit. It's basically saying we're going to be able to play defense, and that's sort of a gamble in all this. And certainly releasing these five guys from Guantanamo is something that will absolutely in increase the hand of the Taliban, al-Qaeda, and their allies in the long fight.
Right, let me say, just ask you this. What do you say? And we had a caller. Uh, we talked about this. We've been talking about it all morning. And at 5 a.m. this morning, we had a very passionate caller that said, listen, I don't care. If one of our guys is, is in the hands of these terrorists and we can get them out, if it means five Taliban, do it because we need to get our boys home. What, what do you say to that when, when, you're, when you're faced with the family of someone who's being held as a POW? Well, I mean, that's the emotional argument. I understand it, and I'm certainly sympathetic to it. But... You know, by that same logic, basically, no deal is a bad deal. I mean, if you had, if we had taken Osama bin Laden into custody, as opposed to killing him in Abbottabad, Pakistan, would have been the right trade to trade Osama bin Laden for uh, Sergeant Bergdahl. I don't think a lot of people would have gone along for that trade. Um, you know, the bottom line is these guys are not as well known as bin Laden. They don't have the brand name that bin Laden did, but they are, you know, on the Taliban side of the equation, just as dangerous. These are guys who are highly lethal, who are. Um, you know, committed jihadists for decades and who are going to do damage in this world. I mean, here's part of the problem in all this is that, you know, Mulud Zakir, this guy I just referenced, who was shipped from Guantanamo back to Afghanistan and became a top military commander for the Taliban after leaving Guantanamo, and who was a subordinate to one of these five, okay? This guy has basically oversaw the deaths of thousands of people since his release from Guantanamo. Most of them are Afghans or Muslims, so we don't really think about that much here in the West, and they don't get the attention that they deserve. But these guys have an inordinate impact on the battlefield when they are released. Okay? It goes beyond just the threat of the immediate terrorist attack on the U.S. And what I'm saying is, if you're going to get into the emotional side of the argument and figure out the impact on lives, think about the thousands of people who are going to be potentially impacted in Afghanistan because of these moves. All right, so the question was asked on the Sunday talk show. Susan Rice, you know, she's had such a good track record of going on the Sunday talk shows. She was sent out to defend the administration on this, and Candy Crowley from CNN asked this question. No longer can it be said that the U.S doesn't negotiate with terrorists. I wouldn't put it that way, Candy. I wouldn't say that How at would you all. Put it? Well, I, when we are in battles with terrorists and, and terrorists take an American prisoner, that prisoner still is a U.S. serviceman or woman. We still have a sacred obligation to bring that person back. We did so, uh, and, and that's what's uh, to be celebrated. So did we negotiate with terrorists in this case? Oh, there's no doubt about it. I mean, this is, this is negotiating with terrorists, but on the terrorist terms, that's the part that she's leaving out. This isn't. This wasn't a real negotiation. This was the Taliban saying, "Hey, give us our five worst commanders you've ever had in custody back, and we'll give you Bo Bergdahl." That's what this was. This wasn't a negotiation. This was, you know, basically we the Obama administration acquiesced to the demands of the Taliban. They sort of caved to the Taliban. And so, it, uh, is there any circumstance when it is appropriate to negotiate with terrorists? I mean, I, I'm I'm ready for all the pushback from MSNBC and Huffington Post. They say, well, Ronald Reagan negotiated with Iran to get hostages free back in the 80s. Oh, I'm I'm not saying you never negotiate with terrorists. I think you can talk to anybody, but you talk. But when you're talking to terrorists or talking to anybody, you should do so with a clear eye of who you're talking to and with your own principles and goals in mind. And what I'm saying here is that this isn't just negotiating with terrorists or talking to terrorists. This is acquiescing to the demands of terrorists. Yeah. This is not. This is not. We got Sergeant Bo Bergdahl back because that's what they were willing to give for the five senior Taliban commanders in custody. This wasn't exactly like there was some haggling going on. The U.S. bettered its position otherwise, right? Because it didn't. We we just acquiesced. We we paid the ransom. Uh, Thomas Jocelyn, uh, senior fellow, Foundation for Defense of Democracies, and also senior editor of Long War Journal. Thanks so much for joining us today.